this week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion about President Abraham Lincoln shifting policies on emancipation during the Civil War. While the Emancipation Proclamation held immense symbolic significance, it did not have immediate practical implications for the freedom of enslaved people. Its effectiveness was contingent upon the Union military success and the eventual defeat of the Confederacy. Virginia Tech University professor Paul Quigley shares more about President Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation, and its success right after this. Before we get to this week's episode, we want to take a minute to ask you for your help. Your financial support will ensure that C-SPAN can continue to produce podcasts that inform you about national politics, introduce you to the latest nonfiction books, and provide valuable historical context to today's news. Make a donation today and be a part of C-SPAN's future. Visit cspan.org slash donate. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, We're going to have a slight... Uh, change of gear today. We're going to talk about the political struggle over emancipation in the U.S. And to start with, I have got a very straightforward, maybe a straightforward question for you all. Who freed America's enslaved people? What do you think? Go ahead, Max. Yes, you could say honest A. Okay. All right. Thanks for making it easy for me to write. Abe? Is that it? Can we go home now? Go ahead. Union Army. Okay, yep. Another good one. Union Army. Go ahead. Calders. Congress, okay. U.S. Congress. Any others? Go ahead. Themselves. Yeah, themselves. So enslaved people themselves. Having trouble getting the word people down there, but there we go. Yeah, so this gives us a sense of the variety of people involved in this process. It's obviously not the kind of question you can answer just with a single word. Um, That would be very nice, uh, but that's not the case with this question. Uh, What we're going to do today is kind of piece together our answer to this question figure out how all of these different individuals and groups participated together, some of them kind of willingly and consciously and deliberately, some of them not so much, um, but how they all contributed to this process of emancipation. And the way we're going to do it is by starting out with the African-American perspective. And in a way, this is the most straightforward one because African-Americans came into the Civil War with one overarching priority of freedom. So that's kind of the easy group to understand their motivations, and that's why we're going to start there. But we're next going to turn to federal emancipation policy, so what's going on in Congress in Washington, D.C.? What is the thinking there about emancipation as a union war goal, and how does that change over the war? And this one is much more complicated than African-American perspectives because it does change so much between 1861 and 63, and then even after that into uh, the later years of the war. And of course, of all the people in Washington, um, Abraham Lincoln as president, as commander-in-chief, is the one who gets talked about the most in terms of who was driving emancipation policy, who was overseeing the whole thing, who's responsible for freeing America's enslaved people. So I think it was uh, very uh, fitting that the first answer I got to the question was honest Abraham Lincoln, um, because for so long he's been the one who's gotten the credit for emancipation, basically. And so we'll spend some time digging into Lincoln's views on race and slavery uh, towards the end of the class. And then finally, we'll look at white northern public opinion, because after all, Lincoln and the Congress, they were um, both responsible to the electorate in the United States. And so public opinion really mattered in terms of what they could do, when, and how. So that's what we've got to look forward to today for purposes of the exam. Um, We've got our usual identification terms, so I encourage you to be on the lookout for these during the course of the lecture. Uh, Think about, if you get the question on the exam, how you would identify these terms and then briefly explain their significance. So the first one is kind of a three-in-one. It's Frank Baker, 
Shepard Mallory and James Townsend. And those three, we'll talk about them in a bit more detail, but just to give you a preview, they're three enslaved men who escaped uh, and made it to Fort Monroe in May 1861. Um, so that's one of the terms. The other, I kind of had to do this given today's topic, is the Emancipation Proclamation. So again, as we're talking about the document and the decisions that went into it, just be thinking about how you would explain the significance in an exam of, uh, of uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. So beginning with the African-American perspective, again, this is by far the most straightforward one to grasp because it stays pretty constant throughout the war and because the same kind of impulse characterizes the large majority of African-Americans during the Civil War years. And that's why I included this sentence in such big font and r the red color, just to let you know uh, that this is a really important fact. It's one that's very obvious, but it's one that's easy to overlook as well, I think, in thinking about how emancipation unfolded during the Civil War. That simple fact that enslaved people wanted freedom, as we'll see, helped to drive a lot of the decisions that other people were making uh, in addition to enslaved people themselves. Um, and this was true, of course, before the Civil War. We've already talked a little bit about escapes from slavery before the Civil War, how important they were in, in uh, driving the political conversation around slavery in the 1850s. Um, so this was true all along, but it continues to be true during the crisis of secession and then into the Civil War years themselves. So uh, this simple fact, uh, let's keep that in the back of our minds when we're thinking about how the process unfolded and especially about the role that African Americans enslaved in the South played in securing their own freedom. At the very beginning of the war, so May 1861, this is when these three guys whose names I've already mentioned, Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend, they're enslaved in Confederate territory in Virginia. And on May 23rd, 1861, they make the decision to row over the bay to Fort Monroe. Sometimes it's called Fortress Monroe. You can use either. Um, but they make the decision to row over the bay to a Union-held Fort Monroe and present themselves to the Union military there and simply say, we've escaped from slavery. We're here for freedom. And, of course, at this point, there's no... U.S. emancipation policy. That's going to come much later. We've talked a little bit about how at the beginning of the war, the official Union war goal was to preserve the Union. Emancipating enslaved people didn't come into it as an official war goal. Um, and yet on May 23rd, so just over a month after Fort Sumter, also, by the way, the same day that the Virginia electorate ratified the decision to secede that the secession convention had made back in April. Um, so literally at the beginning of Virginia's formal membership in the Confederacy and, and as part of the rebellion, rebellion uh, these three guys are already saying, OK, we recognize that there's at least the possibility for freedom here. Um, nothing is official yet. But in practical terms, we know that going to Union territory, uh, presenting ourselves to the Union military, is uh, going to give us at least a greater chance at freedom than we've got back there in Confederate territory and slavery. So they, uh, this is, this is uh, what they do in May 1861. And the onus then is on the Union commander at Fort Monroe, who's a guy named General Benjamin Butler. And he gets to decide this actually really tricky question of, OK, I've got these three people who have uh, come here seeking freedom, uh, seeking escape from enslavement. What do I do about that? Technically, the law of the land is still the fugitive slave law from back in 1850. So technically, um, if you go with the idea that the seceded states have not really left the Union, they're part of the United States still, they just need to be brought back in politically. If you go with that theory, which is what most Union leaders were, were doing in 1861, then technically Butler should have returned these three men to uh, the person in Confederate Virginia who claimed them as his property. But... Butler doesn't end up doing that. 
And one of the reasons is simply because the crisis of war is already beginning to unfold. It's clear that the usual kinds of rules are maybe not going to apply all that much. But the bigger reason why Butler decides not to return them to the, to the Confederate slaveholder is because he learns that these three men are already, in May 1861, being used directly for the Confederate war effort. So their owner has got them working on building Confederate fortifications across the bay from Fort Monroe. So to Butler, it's like their labor is being coerced. They're, they're being forced to provide their labor to build these Confederate military installations that are going to be a direct threat to my position at Fort Monroe. So when you look at it like that, you can understand why he didn't want to follow the law, why he didn't want to send them back into slavery, despite um, what the official position of the Union government was at this point. The way he did that was by using this legal term, contraband of war. And, of course, that had been used in many international conflicts over the years uh, to justify a combatant uh, keeping, confiscating property that was being used by the enemy against them in war. So, of course, these three people were people, not property. Uh, so there was a little bit of a problem there. But for Butler, he found that he was able to use the Confederate idea that enslaved people were property and kind of twist it and turn it against to use it against the Confederacy and say, okay, they are property in the eyes of the Confederacy. They're being used against us in the military conflict that's just beginning. And therefore, I'm going to keep them. And instead of seeing them used against the Union, uh, see if there's a way we can, uh, we can enlist their aid and support for the Union war effort. So this is pretty incredible, you know, especially so early in the war, when nobody really knows what kind of conflict this is going to turn into. Um, Butler really takes a risk in using this legal concept. Um, but because he's able to use this concept that already exists and people you know, are very familiar with, and because it suits the union's purposes, uh, he's able to get away with it. And so then what happens is, is word travels, of course. Enslaved communities had great networks to share information locally, regionally. And so people quickly get wind of this idea that, OK, uh, making it to a union fort uh, especially Fort Monroe, but maybe others as well, uh, can be a way of securing freedom. And so even just at Fort Monroe in the days and weeks following Butler's decision, uh, you see a massive influx of enslaved people coming, saying the same thing. We're here, we're, we're running away from enslavement, and we see the Union military as the way to achieve freedom for ourselves. By the way, how many of you have been to Fort Monroe? I know some of you come from that part of Virginia. Has anyone visited? OK, great. Well, the rest of you, other than Carter, I think you should go. <laughs> it's a great place. Uh, obviously got great uh, significance for Civil War history, even just this one month, May 1861, and what happened there. But it's also uh, one of those historical coincidences. It's also the place where in 1619, the first recorded Africans were imported into Virginia. Um, and so people say that's the place where slavery in America began. And in 1861, that's where slavery in America began to end. Of course, there's a lot that has to happen before that, but this is the beginning of the end. What you see in other parts of the country is similar kinds of things. Enslaved people presenting themselves at Union lines, seeking freedom, and Union commanders trying to decide, what should I do with this? You know, how should I respond? And different Union commanders decide to respond in different kinds of ways. So John C. Fremont, who's in Missouri, he takes a decision in August 1861. Uh, things are not going well for the Union in Missouri. It's not seceded, but there are military actions going on which are generally going in the favor of the Confederacy. Um, so he needs something to happen to improve the Union situation. And so he uh, rules, he declares that he's going to free persons who are enslaved by rebel slaveholders, so Confederate sympathizers in Missouri. Do you think that would fit, do you think that would fit with the Union 
government's perspective with the Union government's approach to emancipation and the war in August 1861. At that point, it seemed that the Union, uh, especially Lincoln, wanted to preserve the Union how it was, so leave the slave, the slave, slave states as they were and the mm-hmm. free states as they are. And, yeah, so it seems like it goes against like the general consensus of the Union. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is, and I've got my Lego Lincoln to illustrate what he said in return. Hold your horses. This is going too far, too fast. And pretty much uh, the idea is that we're not ready to make this a war about emancipation. And especially in a border slaveholding state like Missouri, which is still in the Union, because Lincoln in 1861 and after that is uh, really placing heavy priority on keeping the loyalty of those states. And Lang Freeman uh, uh, emancipate the uh, enslaved people, even if it's only Confederate sympathizers, is going to destabilize slavery in Missouri and possibly tip them over the edge into seceding and joining the Confederacy. So that's always a major concern for Lincoln in the first year or two of the war. Um, And then uh, further south and east in the Sea Islands of Georgia and South Carolina, there's another Union general, David Hunter, who goes even further in May 1862. He's based in the Sea Islands, and as we've discussed before, that's one of the first areas that the Union is able to control um, going in from the ocean. Um, So he's in the Sea Islands. He takes it upon himself to proclaim a complete end to slavery in three entire Confederate states, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. So compared to what Butler had done at Fort Monroe, even compared to what Fremont had tried to do in Missouri, this is huge. This is going the whole way towards emancipation and really trying to uh, make this war a war to end slavery. And in this case, this is an even easier decision for our friend Lincoln to, uh, to overrule and say, absolutely not, you know, this is going to change the tenor of the war. It's going to make it more difficult for us to maintain the loyalty of the white northern public, of the border slaveholding states. It's just going too far. So generally, 1861 into 1862... The story is that the Union authorities are okay with kind of limited, tightly focused emancipation efforts that are closely related to the actual prosecution of the war. What they're not okay with is anything that looks like general emancipation, anything that looks like they're trying to uh, completely overturn slavery as a system. So... um, all of this is, is driven to a large degree by enslaved people, just, at, just like at Fort Monroe, um, going to the Union lines, uh, interpreting the Union lines as, as a, a space of freedom, and forcing these Union commanders to decide. And these are just two examples on the extreme end of the em- emancipationist spectrum. Of course, there were lots of other examples that don't go that far um, of Union commanders trying to figure out what to do. But while all this is going on, abolitionists, both white abolitionists and black abolitionists in the North, are trying to do, I think, something somewhat similar to enslaved people in the South, which is trying to make the case that whatever Lincoln believes in 1861 about what the war should be or what he can do constitutionally, um, the Union should make this a war against slavery. And so this was uh, a a very strong claim made by Frederick Douglass, among others. And, of course, we've got a great example you read for today. Frederick Douglass's September 1861 newspaper article, Cast Off the Millstone. And I think he gives us some great insights into how abolitionists made that argument that the Union war effort really needed to become a war against slavery. So based on your reading of that article, what would you say? How, how does Douglas assess the Union war goals? What does he think Union war goals are in 1861? Uh, how effective or ineffective does he think they might be? Uh, sort of, Douglas first assesses that the Union's goals are kind of like half measures. Like just reunifying the Union without abolition would just result in another war 
who knows how far down the road. Um, and the analogy of the millstone is that as long as slavery exists anywhere in the Union, it's as if you're dangling a heavy burden off of the Union's neck. And until that's gone away, the problem will never truly be solved. Yeah, yeah, nicely said. I think that captures it really well. Um, he's talking about, you know, quite rightly, talking about the, the Union war goal is clearly to save the Union, to bring the seceding states back into the Confederacy. Um, union leadership has explicitly said we're not going after slavery. Um, for Douglas, this is a contradiction. It's a, an unworkable policy in the long term. He says that uh, they need to make this an abolition war. Those are the words he uses. So how does he kind of push that case forward? What, what arguments does he make for this position that the Union should make this an abolition war? Did any of you pick up, uh, there was a phrase that kind of jumped out of, of Douglas's article uh, where he says, slavery is the stomach of the rebellion, which I think helps, uh, helps us understand where he's coming from, how he's making this argument. What do you suppose he meant by that? Slavery is the stomach of the rebellion. Cotton. I think it goes back to um, <clears throat> one of the other readings that we did. Um, it was mentioned that slavery being the primary cause of secession led to the war itself. And it's sort of, as he said, if the war ends without slavery also being ended, it will just turn on the war. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a really good point uh, at the back. Slavery being the stomach of the rebellion. I mean, slavery is, you know, how I like, take it literally, slavery is like how the South was able to like, punch as an economy. Mm -hmm. It's like how they like, eat themselves, too. Yeah. So you take away slavery, you take away their economy, you take away their ability to be self-sustaining, you win the war. Yeah, absolutely. I think that gets to the heart of it. He's saying, you know, in a, in a literal sense, and slave labor is producing a lot of the food that's feeding the Confederate soldiers, feeding the Confederate population, and slave labor is producing, you know, things like the textiles that make uniforms for the armies and just everything, all the resources, or many of the resources that the Confederacy needs and is using to prosecute this war against the Union is directly coming from enslaved labor. That's at the heart of the Confederate economy. So his point is, if we, whatever we can do to take that away from the Confederacy, if we can find a way to uh, bring even some of that labor of the millions of enslaved people in the Confederacy into the Union side, onto the Union side of things, then we're going to have a much better chance of winning the war. Um, and the other thing he says as well, just to reinforce that, is he refers to foreign opinion, which by this point is, um, you know, at least in Western Europe, countries like Britain and France, uh, who both sides on the Civil War are trying to get the sympathies of. Well, Britain and France by the 1860s are, are pretty firmly against slavery. So Douglas makes the good point, which is completely accurate, that if... They can, if the Union can make this look like a war of slavery versus freedom with the Union on the freedom side, then they'll have a much better chance of uh, retaining the sympathy of those European countries and denying the sympathy of those European countries to the Confederacy. So um, Douglas, I think, sets out that case. And he, he's not the only one making the case. Uh, lots of other black abolitionists, white abolitionists are making the same kind of argument. Um, but I think he conveys it really well, just this simple idea. If you try to limit the war just to preserving the Union, it's going to be extremely difficult to defeat the Confederacy. But if you expand the war to include emancipation as a war goal, it's going to become much easier uh, for the Union to defeat the Confederacy. So um, Douglas is, is pressing this case in speeches and newspaper articles. Um, and enslaved people are pressing a similar kind of case, you know, voting with their feet, escaping from enslavement, showing up at the Union forts and encampments, and uh, seeking freedom. So from the beginning, I think it's clear that most black people uh, saw this very clearly as a war that should be about emancipation, should be about securing the end of slavery and seeking freedom. But for the first year or so of the war, most of what we've talked about so far, um, you've probably gotten the message that the, the onus was really on African Americans themselves. So it's mostly the case that 
uh, black people are doing the pushing, and then the leadership, whether it's the military leadership or the political leadership, are kind of reacting to what they're doing and, and, and being pressured and encouraged along the way by African Americans. Well, let's turn to uh, Washington, D.C. now and take a look at federal policy. And, and as I said, this is much more uh, variable, changes a lot more during the Civil War than, uh, than the African-American priorities do. And by the way, the picture is of the US Capitol building. I think it was taken actually at Lincoln's uh, inauguration in March 1861. And it shows that the Capitol is under construction, which people often see as kind of a symbolic, you know, they're in the middle of replacing the dome of the Capitol. They've kind of um, taken apart this really important symbol of the American, of the US federal government. And during the Civil War, it's being rebuilt and reconstructed. And of course, that's a nice metaphor for what was happening during the Civil War. But in, in the Capitol building, uh, Congress, of course, had important decisions to face about emancipation policy, uh, as well as every other thing connected to the war. And of course, at the beginning, in 1861, neither Congress nor Lincoln, as president, made that decision to turn this into a war for emancipation. And I think one obvious question to ask is, is why not? Why didn't Lincoln or Congress just decide in 1861, okay, Frederick Douglass is right, you know, we do need to turn this into a war against slavery if we're going to win it. Um, this is what we want anyway. Lincoln is anti-slavery. Uh, the Republicans hold the majority in Congress. They're anti-slavery in different kinds of ways. Um, so the question is, why didn't they do that in 1861? What, what do you think, Riley? I think um, everyone there was, uh, especially in the Union, they weren't wanting to make this really a war about uh, emancipation. They were wanting to more along the lines of what uh, Lincoln's vision was in, to preserve the Union. If mm -hmm. they had gone to war specifically to end slavery at that time, there might not have been as, I guess you can say the word is like, passion, like patriotism uh, and willingness of the soldiers to, to fight. Yeah. So. yeah, so Lincoln sets the tone from the top, and you, you know, you've read his inaugural address from 1861 in March, uh, where he says, you know, this isn't a war uh, that's going to end slavery. I don't think the president has the authority to actually do that. So he sets the tone from the top. And then public opinion, including soldiers, you mentioned, Riley, uh, would have been, it would have been very difficult to actually sell this to the northern public, including all those guys you want in uniform in 1861. Uh, they were simply not ready, for the most part, uh, to accept that emancipation was something that they wanted to fight for, risk their lives, and all of that kind of thing. Any other thoughts on that? Why, you know, any other barriers to... Uh, abolitionism in 1861. Okay. I think they kind of saw emancipation as um, something that would almost be ne like negatively impacting their desire to preserve the medium at the time, because it wasn't it wasn't a foregone or predetermined conclusion at this point that they were about to fight a four-year-long war. Right. So it might emancipation probably was seen as being something a little too risky in the context of trying to keep the union together. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. I mean, if they had known what the war was going to turn into, maybe then it would have made sense in 1861 as a policy decision. Uh, but of course, they didn't know that. They did know that um, emancipation would be revolutionary, uh, an incredibly radical move on the part of the federal government that um, from the perspective of 1861 would just exacerbate the crisis rather than solving the, the problems that led to the Civil War. That's what they thought in 1861. At the back. I think um, one interesting topic about this is one of our readings was discussing the Union soldier. And a lot of people at the time that were in the Union didn't fight specifically for emancipation. Yep. Um, specifically, this one was, in fact, a supporter of the Democrats and was from the North and discusses that when he began to fight, a lot of them, like himself and fellow soldiers, were having doubts to the point where there were soldiers in the Union 
basically deserting and going to join the Confederacy. Because they didn't fight for emancipation, they fought for the uh, Union and the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah, he's a... So, um, the, the reading that we did for, uh, for today um, r- were letters written by this white Union soldier from Ohio. We're actually going to discuss them a little bit later in class. Um, but I do think they help us to understand uh, the um, widely held opinion among white Northerners that emancipation was not something worth fighting for. Um, whether that's in 1861 or in this case, he's writing these letters in 1863 and 4. So even after the Emancipation Proclamation, there's still a lot of pushback. And certainly in 1861, that would be the majority opinion among the, the northern white electorate. So Lincoln, Congress, they really had to take this stuff seriously. Go ahead. It was interesting as well because the public opinion in the north, they typically still didn't like slavery but they didn't see any alternative solutions to the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they were not at all sure that emancipation was going to make the United States, you know, an ideal country. Um, There was still, we've talked about the levels of white supremacy, racism among white northerners, and so maybe uh, even if they didn't like slaveholders too much, maybe they didn't really feel as though African Americans could participate in American society as equals um, and be productive citizens. That's still a very common view among white northerners during the Civil War. So yeah, there are these barriers to abolitionism, uh, which Lincoln and Congress are very, very aware of in 1861. I'd also um, mention the border states that came up a little bit before. In 1861, Lincoln is really trying to keep the border states um, on his side, on the side of the Union war effort. And going too quickly with emancipation would certainly have at least disrupted the loyalty, you know, lessened the loyalty of the border slaveholding states to the Union. So all of these things change slowly, and that, that's part of the story of emancipation is, you know, there are changes in northern public opinion, there are changes in the military situation, changes in the way um, the government is addressing the problem. Um, and so gradually you see a change. Um, I sometimes think about these laws which are up on the screen there as kind of stepping stones towards emancipation. And, of course, at the time they were passing these laws, they didn't really know what the end was going to be. But in retrospect, you can see each of these as steps along the way towards the final Emancipation Proclamation. So you've read a little bit about these, but the the August 1861 First Confiscation Act is the one that liberated enslaved people whose labor was being used to aid the rebellion. So, in a way, it's an affirmation of the kind of thing Benjamin Butler had done at Fort Monroe in May 1861. And then in 1862, uh, Congress decides that even if they're still kind of hesitant about going after slavery as an entire system, at least they can exercise authority in the geographic locations where they have ultimate power. Um, So Washington, D.C. is one of those and the federal territories is another. So there's none of the constitutional qualms that you know we've talked about and we'll talk about, uh, about ending slavery altogether in the states um, when it comes to these two locations. So that's a fairly easy thing for Congress to do, is to end slavery in Washington, D.C. and in the federal territories. And then in July 1862, you get the second Confiscation Act. And, you know, obviously building on the first, you, you get the sense from the name of it that is picking up and, and pushing it further along. Um, and the second Confiscation Act said that people enslaved by rebel slaveholders were permanently freed, regardless of whether their labor was being directly used for the Confederate war effort. So it just expands from the first Confiscation Act and um, make, makes uh, more enslaved people liable for this, uh, this kind of emancipation. The other thing the Second Confiscation Act did, by the way, is it explicitly called on Lincoln as commander-in-chief um, to kind of take control of the process, uh, specifically by issuing some kind of directive or declaration or proclamation, uh, laying out his uh, take on emancipation as commander-in-chief. 
because so much of this story is tied up with um, the progress of the military side of things and the Union armies. Um, well, who's in charge of the Union armies? It's Abraham Lincoln as commander-in-chief. So Congress, by this point, is pretty much saying we're doing what we can with these, the, these legislative stepping stones, um, but really the commander-in-chief needs to... Uh, exercise some control over the process and, and try and guide it a little bit more directly. So that, I think, helps understand a little bit of the timing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So I think Congress um, is certainly a major, major actor in the story of emancipation. You know, the question at the beginning, I think Congress uh, deserves a lot of credit for the progress toward emancipation. But somehow, there's one resident of Washington, D.C., who usually gets most of the credit for emancipation, right? This guy. Has anyone seen this statue, by the way? I know it's uh, kind of a narrow view of the statue. It doesn't give you a good sense of where it is. But this is in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. Um, so some of you may have walked past it or, or even seen it without really connecting it with the image you see on the screen. But what kind of image does this uh, give you about Lincoln and his role in the emancipation process. Go ahead. I think it sort of portrays him as being a liberator. Um, he's got the skull of the Emancipation Proclamation in his right hand, and yeah. based on his posture and position, it's sort of like saying, like, be free. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the you know the posture in statues is always really important to look at and pay attention to. And in this one, Lincoln is kind of towering over um, this African-American figure who's on his knees, uh, still in chains, maybe broken chains around his wrists. Um, and it's clear that Lincoln is the one in control of this process, right? He's the one standing tall, uh, holding his hand out. Um, he's, the, he's got the Emancipation Proclamation. Presumably, that's what the scroll is. I think you're right there, Carter. Um, so he's in control. I think another um, important thing to maybe talk about is um, he has his hand clenched up and on uh, the podium that is uh, next to Lincoln, and it's almost like he's trying to say, like, you know, I'm putting my faith mm. into uh, into the government. I'm putting my faith in into Lincoln in a yeah. way. Yeah, kind of pledging loyalty to Lincoln. Um, also expressing gratitude, I think. You know, that's the kneeling posture. Again, that's really important in statues. Um, uh, so I think he's absolutely conveying that sense of gratitude, you, you know, almost as though Lincoln gave him the gift of emancipation and freedom, uh, pledging his loyalty, his fealty to Lincoln as the representative of the U.S. federal government. Um, yeah, I think uh, those are some really good points about this statue. And really, it's part of a, a much wider way of representing Lincoln as the great emancipator. That's the phrase that people have often used to describe uh, Lincoln's role in this process. And so these are just a couple of other examples. Um, the one on the left is a Courier and Ives print from the 19th century. Similar kind of uh, story being told. Uh, the grateful, uh, formerly enslaved man. Uh, this time, there's also uh, a woman and children standing behind him as well. Um, but the basic message is the same, right? Lincoln's in control of this. And then I like the example on the right. Um, the statue, again, is saying the same kind of thing about the great emancipator. But this one is a, a, long, a lot further away from us than Washington, D.C. There's a little clue on uh, the bottom of the plinth here in memory of Scottish-American soldiers. Um, and this statue is in Edinburgh in Scotland. And so I used to teach there, including U.S. Civil War history. And so this was, this was actually the field trip that I would take my students to. It was just about a mile away from the university campus. So it was nice that even in Scotland, we had a place we could go to to, to learn a little bit about Civil War history. Um, but Lincoln obviously um, is an important actor in this process, even if he's not the great, the great emancipator, right? The only one who's playing any role in this process. Um, as you know, 
I hope. Uh, Lincoln did, in fact, sign the Emancipation Proclamation, so it's like you can't take that away from him. Uh, you can't say he didn't, uh, he didn't play an important role in this process. But um, the myth of the great emancipator, I think, kind of blows that up a little bit too much and certainly obscures all of the contributions of the other people we've already talked about in pushing union emancipation policy forward over the years. So this idea of the great emancipator has come under criticism for that reason. But there's another reason as well by Lincoln as the great emancipator has come under attack over the years. And that's because even Lincoln's take on slavery and race, racial equality, were not quite, was not quite as straightforward as we might expect from a guy who's known as the great emancipator. Um, People have read Lincoln's words carefully, of course. He's one of the most studied, about, studied individuals in uh, human history. Uh, so there's an awful lot been written on Lincoln, including his take on slavery and race, uh, which were complicated and changed over time. And one way to, just the easy way, I think, to begin to think about this is I've just picked out three representative quotations up on the screen there, which I think... So sort of give us uh, glimpses, insights, of course not the whole story, but little snapshots of Lincoln's thinking about slavery at different points in time. So you've actually read two of these in, in different classes this semester, but um, I'll give you a moment just to glance over those quotations and see if we can figure out Lincoln's uh, real position on slavery. All right, so I think the question is, uh, looking at these quotations, help me figure this out. Uh, was this guy, the great emancipator, was he actually an abolitionist or not? Okay. I think the biggest thing to look at with Lincoln is that his entire presidency, he spends it torn between how he personally feels and the responsibility of his office. Yeah. Uh, it's the responsibility of his office to reunify the Union and protect what's laid out in the Constitution. But it's his personal feeling that he wants to abolish slavery. I think he was an abolitionist in that sense. But nowhere in the orders of the President of the United States does it say, oh, you have to abolish slavery as soon as you get the chance. Yeah. So I think he spends a lot of his time leading up to the proclamation torn between, again, his personal feelings and what his job is as the President of the United States. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's crucial. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll second that. I think, you know, in the first quote from 1858, it's pretty clear that, like, in his heart, Lincoln was anti-slavery. However, once he took office, he probably didn't really see himself as having the authority or even the necessity at the time to abolish slavery right then and there. Um, and you also, if you also go back to the first one, it says... Uh, it was in course of ultimate extinction. Mm -hmm. So he may have also been of the opinion that just with time, slavery was going to end. Yeah. And he necessarily, like in 1861 or 1862, if he didn't see it as being prudent in the context of the war or policy in general, he didn't necessarily you know, see it as something that needed to be done right then. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think primarily going off the uh, last quote, um, I mean, it begins to quite paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. Um, it kind of aligned where you hit two birds at one stone with the Civil War mm -hmm. because he'd already had that feeling in his heart that he wanted to eliminate slavery and there was already a preface where he was able to with his election and then once the war began, I mean, as we saw with the, the Union commanders, it just kind of started falling into place where it wasn't an objective, but it just became, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of correlated. Yeah. It came together. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely get, and I think that, that fits with what everyone else has said as well. I think that distinction of Lincoln's personal views versus his idea about what he can do as president is crucial. There's a big gap there in his mind. Um, and so he seems to pretty consistently have been against slavery in personal terms. Um, 
But from the beginning of the war, and we, we talked about his first inaugural address a few weeks ago, from the beginning of the war, he's got this idea, which most people share with him, that he's got no constitutional authority to end slavery in any complete sense as president of the United States. And I think the story, which gets back to your point, is um, the story is a kind of nice coincidence, really, where his personal... Uh, aspirations and beliefs neatly kind of come into alignment with the realities on the ground, the changing circumstances of the war, point him towards emancipation policy. And this is great for Lincoln. He, he doesn't have to think twice about that because this is what he's wanted all along. He's just been reluctant to do it. He's believed that he wasn't able to do it early in the war. Um, and so for Lincoln, I think he in many ways gets what where he w would like to have been earlier, but that just wasn't politically possible for him earlier. Um, I just want to dig a little bit deeper into the last one, the letter to Harris Greeley. Um, and of course, you read uh, this whole letter for today's class, not just this one quotation. Um, and I want to ask you about the timing and the context of this. Because if you notice the date, it's August 22nd, 1862. So how does that fit in with everything else that's going on with the emancipation process? Daniel? Doesn't the emancipation proclamation happen like at the very beginning of 1863? So if that's the case, then if he's struggling at this moment with, should I be concentrating on freeing all the slaves or none of them? to go from whatever position he held at the time of this letter to let's free all the slaves right here and right now in the span of three to four months. That's that's pretty stark contrast to, you know, especially his uh, first uh, inaugural address. Yeah, you're right that the final Emancipation Proclamation comes into being, uh, comes into effect on January 1st, 1863. Um, so you're right to say that's quite the change. But your point uh, is even more powerful than you think it is because this is even closer in time to the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, um, which is just a month after this in September 1862. Jacob, you were going to dive in. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the big like, rallying point that Lincoln was kind of waiting for at yeah. this point to emancipate yeah. uh, the slave people. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And this is something that uh, people at the time didn't know. Like Horace Greeley, of course, wrote this uh, public letter saying to Lincoln, similar kind of thing that Frederick Douglass had said the year before, you know, let's make this uh, a war for emancipation. Um, and this was Lincoln's reply to him. Um, people at the time didn't know, but we know now that by August 22nd, 1862, Lincoln had already decided that he was going to release the preliminary emancipation proclamation. Um, he actually made that decision in July 1862, several weeks before this. Um, he brought the draft to his cabinet. He said, I'm going to do this. Obviously, the Second Confiscation Act had told him to do something like this. Um, and so the feedback from the cabinet was that, OK, this is, this is a fine decision, but the timing isn't right now. because." We, the Union, are militarily at a weak point in the war. This was July 1862 when they're having this conversation. So it's coming uh, shortly after McClellan's failed Peninsula campaign, the Seven Days Battles around Richmond. The Union is kind of on its back foot. Um, so the cabinet tells Lincoln, do this, but do it from a position of strength. Because any time you introduce a transformative policy decision, that you know is going to be controversial, that you know people aren't all going to be behind, you want to do it when you're in a position of strength, not weakness. And, and so that's exactly right. So at this point, he's going to do it. He knows he's going to do it. Um, he's just waiting for some positive news from the battlefield. Um, just before we leave Lincoln um, for a moment, I just want to mention as well that in addition to his kind of mixed signals about slavery that you see in, the, in these quotations, um, we don't have time to get into it in today's class, but he also sent very mixed signals through his life about race and specifically about racial equality. And he's on record as saying that he did not believe white and black people 
were equal, could be equal. He's also on record even more insistently saying that because so many white Americans hold that belief in racial inequality, um, there's no way after slavery ends that the two races can live side by side in the United States as equal partners in politics and society and culture. Um, so Lincoln is one of those uh, Americans who believes in colonization. So the idea is that, okay, we can end slavery, but we also want to move as many African-American people as possible out of U.S. territory so that you know, we don't have to deal with the challenges of being a biracial society. And this has got a long history, decades-long history, the colonization movement. Um, Lincoln is just one of many proponents of that idea. And the important point for today is that he's still um, advocating colonization. Even now, in August 1862, he's decided he's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, but he's still saying, but you know, we, that, that needs to go along with some kind of colonization so that we avoid uh, those problems generated by so many white Americans' belief in racial inequality. Um, so, complicated figure, lots of books written about Lincoln, including just the stuff we've talked about uh, in the last few minutes, um, but we'll move on. I think I see a question from Miles, though. Do you think by, like, January 1865, and like the 13th Amendment, that Lincoln still holds that view of colonization? Yeah, this is a really good question. We're, we're talking about today's class about shifts in attitudes and policies roughly from 1861 to 63. Um, but things continued to change after 1863, including with Lincoln and lots of other people as well. Um, and I think Lincoln certainly grew and learned a lot racially during the Civil War. Um, even by 1863, he's kind of moved further along to a more of a progressive uh, position uh, than he had at the beginning of the war. And certainly by 1865, we'll talk in a few minutes uh, just very briefly about uh, the importance of African-American soldiers to the Union war effort in the second half of the war. And among other things, seeing how important black soldiers were to Union victory and seeing the commitment of black soldiers on the battlefield, off the battlefield, um, helped persuade Lincoln, among many other white Americans, that um, you know, racial inequality wasn't as kind of fixed and pronounced as they may have thought before. So yeah, I think in answer to your question, I think Lincoln certainly moved more in the direction we would want him to move in, um, uh, even more so between 1863 and 65. Okay. So uh, he's waiting. He's waiting for good news from the battlefield. And we, we've already talked about Antietam in September 1862, so there are no surprises there. And, of course, it's not like a dramatic, spectacular, complete <coughs> annihilation of the Confederate forces. Uh, those kinds of victories are rare in the Civil War. But Antietam is enough of a Union victory it ends with Confederate forces retreating back into Confederate territory. That's enough for Lincoln to um, make the decision. Now's the time, just a few days after Antietam, uh, to release the preliminary emancipation proclamation. And this, so this is the preliminary proclamation, uh, doesn't really do anything that takes effect immediately. Uh, this is the one that says if the Confederates are still rebelling, in rebellion, on January 1st, 1863, then the emancipation policy will take effect. And enslaved people in territories still in rebellion in 1863 will be declared free. So what it does is it gives the Confederates a way out, actually. It gives the Confederates a path it's kind of a, you know, a warning. Uh, it's, it's a path for the Confederates if they change, if they decide to give up their fight to leave the United States, then they can do so with slavery intact. So even though it's the Emancipation Proclamation, it's like an offer to the Confederates, really, that we will not carry out uh, emancipation if you decide to stay in the Union. So you still see that priority of uh, saving the Union, preserving the United States over emancipation. 
Even the final proclamation, of course, by the way, you know the Confederates didn't give up fighting. They, they did not take that decision. Even the final Emancipation Proclamation, I'm sure you've all heard people say before, well, it didn't free a single person because the way they wrote it is it only applied to Confederate territory that was still in rebellion. So that excluded, of course, the border slaveholding states um, that had not seceded from the Union. So slavery was still intact. Uh, some of them uh, ended slavery during the war. Two of them, Kentucky and Delaware, actually waited until December 1865 when the 13th Amendment was ratified. So slavery still exists in these border slaveholding states. Um, and the final Emancipation Proclamation also excluded the territories that the Union, at this point in the war, had already got under their control and were in occupation of. So um, parts of Louisiana, especially around New Orleans, parts of Northern Virginia were included in that. Um, so it was a limited proclamation, and it only, in fact, applied to places where Lincoln, on January 1st, had zero practical authority or power, Confederate territory. Go ahead. Did the Confederates take this seriously at all, or did they just kind of laugh it off since it didn't affect anything? No, the Confederates took it very seriously, and they saw it as a signal, really, that the stakes of the war had changed. So it's like up until then, you know, and explicitly in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, um, in the back of their minds, it was a, always an option that the U.S. could be restored as it was in the 1850s. They would keep slavery intact. But now with this proclamation, they recognize that that was, I mean, still a possibility, honestly, but uh, an increasingly slim possibility that um, they would actually be able to lose the war and keep slavery. So they take it very seriously. Mostly they complain about it, you know, as you would imagine. They blame Lincoln. Uh, they say he's trying to uh, whip up insurrections of enslaved people. He's trying to promote a kind of race war in our territory. Uh, so they have a lot to say about the Emancipation Proclamation. But I think uh, when they become realistic, I think they realize this is really bad for our chances of a good outcome uh, from this conflict. If we lose the war, we're going we're gonna to end slavery in all likelihood. Go ahead. Did the emancipation um, embolden Confederate soldiers like, to what they believe in, plunge and titty fighting? Yeah, I think it did. You know, there are lots of variations in how individuals respond to uh, big proclamations or other political policy changes like this. But yeah, I'd say for the most part, it did um, um, redouble Confederate soldiers' commitment to fighting for the Confederacy. Because um, now, you know, again, the stakes are higher. You know, if they're, particularly if they're slaveholders, you know, they have always known that in some, to some degree, in some ways, fighting for the Confederacy is about their individual property. Um, but now that becomes more real with the Emancipation Proclamation. Even if they're not slaveholders, um, most of them are afraid of the prospect of, you know, emancipation leading to violence in the, in the southern states and, um, you know, making their lives even more difficult. So, yeah, I think the general pattern was the Emancipation Proclamation kind of uh, fueled Confederate commitment to continue fighting. All right. Um, so uh, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, does a couple of other things as well. In addition to kind of symbolically signaling a, a transformation in the Union war effort, it does a couple of other things that don't get talked about so much. One of them is that it explicitly encouraged enslaved people to come to Union lines and gain their freedom. So. Up until this point, even though a lot of uh, those people had gained their freedom by doing that, it had been more like, okay, now you're here, we'll accept that you're free or, or grant you freedom. Um, but after the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1863, the message is, we want you to come. So it's a much more proactive uh, invitation to enslaved African Americans. Stop 
fighting, you know, or not fighting, but stop allowing your labor to be coercively used for the Confederate war effort. Instead, come to us. Um, you can help with the Union war effort, and you'll gain your freedom. So it, it, it's much more proactive uh, like that. And then the other thing is the final proclamation uh, explicitly invited black men into the U.S. military as well. So this had happened a little bit in 1862, um, but in small numbers, and it was only really after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 uh, that large numbers of African-American soldiers were able to join the U.S. military and uh, play a really crucial role in the winning of the war. We have a question right here. Yeah, how did uh, the enslaved people in the South receive word of the Emancipation Proclamation and what uh, it entailed? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, how did enslaved people communicate? You know, how did they receive the news? Um, you'll remember that they were legally uh, white people in the in the southern states legally prohibited from teaching enslaved people to read or write. Um, some of them got around that, you know, a good number. So there was the possibility that some of them were able to read in the newspapers. But typically through more informal communication networks, so just kind of in the day-to-day -day business of, you know, someone from a neighboring plantation gets word, maybe they're on the coast and there's some news that comes in by boat or, you know, something like that. So enslaved people were actually... Uh, pretty well informed throughout the Civil War as to the general tenor of what was going on with the war. And those three guys in, at Fort Monroe in May 1861 are a great example of that. They knew exactly what was going on and they decided to take advantage of it. And that continues to be true. Of course, once you get into the Deep South uh, Confederate territory, it takes longer, it's harder for word to spread, but it still spreads. Okay, uh, let's see. So even after this, there's lots of work to be done. Um, most immediately, of course, the Union has to actually win the war in order uh, for this emancipation policy to really become meaningful. Um, and when the Union did win the war with the surrenders in the spring of 1865, the large majority of enslaved people in the Confederacy were still enslaved. So it's been estimated that by spring 1865, about one in every seven enslaved people in the Confederate States had already gained freedom because of the Union Army marching through and occupying their territory. Um, the rest, six in every seven, uh, were still enslaved in the spring of 1865. It was only by winning the war that the Union could actually implement emancipation policy. And of course, even after that, even after Union victory, there are still some question marks. I referred to this before. You know, there's a much smaller possibility that the Confederate states will be able to keep slavery, but it's still just about thinkable that they might manage to do that. For example, uh, legal challenges to emancipation policy. Uh, constitutionally, you know, this is an unprecedented situation. So there's always that question, even when the Union wins the war, are the Confederate states somehow going to be able to challenge this legally and, and retain slavery? Um, and uh, it really wasn't until the 13th Amendment, as I said before, that slavery was 100% over, at least in the form that it existed until then. Um, it took the 13th Amendment to finish off slavery in, in the border slaveholding states, Kentucky and Delaware, uh, most notably. Um, and nationwide, to get that into the Constitution was the only way they could be sure that it was definitely gone. So uh, just a quick look. We've, we've not got tons of time left, but we can have a, a quick uh, look at white northern public opinion and how it changed. And as I mentioned before, this is a major influence on governmental policy, whether it's Congress or Lincoln. You know, they're responsible to the northern electorate. There are congressional elections throughout the Civil War. There's also the presidential election in 1864. We'll talk about that in the future, but for now, just know that Lincoln was by no means guaranteed victory. And in fact, he believed uh, at one point leading up to the election that he was not going to win it. So he's always thinking about the electorate. Um, and the story there is, uh, of course, at the beginning of the war, there's a lot of hostility. There's a lot of skepticism. 
Um, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, though, that, that continues to a lesser degree. So lots of white Northerners um, continue to be, you know, uh, believe in racial inequality, continue to believe that emancipation was not the right thing to fight for, um, and so on and so forth. And Lincoln addresses some of these critics in a kind of pithy quotation in the summer of 1863. So he's saying to these dissenters, okay, I hear you. I know you're saying you don't want to fight to end slavery. But, uh, as he puts it, some of them seem willing to fight for you. And that reference, of course, is to those thousands of African-American soldiers who by this point are flooding into the recruiting, uh, into the Union military and really helping turn the tide of the Civil War. So one factor that changed a lot of people's minds really was the evidence from the battlefield that black soldiers who were only there because of the emancipation policy were helping turn the tide of the war and helping the Union win victory. Um, that, by the way, is going to be the subject of a future class. We'll talk about African-American soldiers um, and we've got a good example of this who's already come up briefly before. This uh, white Union soldier from Ohio, Chauncey Welton. He's a good example, I think, of these changing views about emancipation, even after the proclamation. So we can spend just a couple of minutes taking a look at his ideas and, and, and thinking really about the question of how, why, and when he changes his mind about emancipation. Based on his letters, how would you answer that? What's the process? Uh, what are the main factors involved? Go ahead. So in his first letter to his father, he kind of, he like says that um, the people in the Union Army did not enlist to fight for slave people. And he was, or about people already deserting because of Lincoln's proclamation. And like as his letters pro progress, he acknowledges he thinks that Lincoln might have like always planned to do this, mm -hmm. and he talks about that as like being a bad thing. But then, as his opinion changes more, he starts to acknowledge that that actually might have been smart of Lincoln to do that. And he says at one point, like, if he would have even done this six months earlier, then it would not have gotten the support that they get from the people in the North. And um, by the end of it, he acknowledges, like, he says he wants to crush the rebels forever and that this is the best way to weaken the rebellion and that it's worked. And the final thing he says is how he's grateful that the bloody war, the four years of bloody warfare, basically over slight grade is, is over. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what, what a great summary of his changing views. And that's exactly why I assigned these letters, because he's such a perfect example of someone who goes into things. I mean, we just we pick up his story in 1863. Um, we can only imagine what he was saying in 1861. But in 1863, he's saying, I don't want to fight for the Emancipation Proclamation. This was a terrible decision, terrible policy to have uh, for the Union war effort. And gradually, he kind of changes his mind, as you've laid out. And he talks a lot about copperheads, um, who are and also going to be a subject of a future class. But these are dissenters in the North, so Northern Democrats, who vote against and speak out against Lincoln and his war effort. So towards the end of the war, Chauncey Welton is also becoming increasingly frustrated with these northern dissenters who are complaining about the war effort. They want to make peace with the Confederacy. And uh, that, I think, feeds into his increasing, maybe admiration is too strong a word, but you know, acceptance of African Americans as soldiers who are playing a really important part in this war effort. One more thing. Uh, we're going to return to the question we started with. Uh, who, well, I've changed it, I've added a word. Who really freed America's enslaved people? Um, what do you think now? Do you have any different answers? Have your responses to that question changed at all over the last hour or so? Go ahead, all the way in the back. So the Union Army, the ninth, and yeah. just winning the war. Um, six out of seven freed after war was won. Yeah. That's yeah, the Union Army, I think that's a really good point, rises to the surface as a major force for emancipation throughout the war. You know, beginning with 
Benjamin Butler in May 1861, but after the Emancipation Proclamation, as I said, it's only when they march into Confederate territories that the Emancipation Proclamation takes force. So I think they're a major, major player here as well. Miles? I think looking back as historians, we like to have a nice, calm, you know, picture of like this person did this thing. But I think it's also important to recognize that I guess like I can choose like three groups all have their individual agency and free enslaved people so the enslaved people themselves mm -hmm. and how to steal lives and speaking against you know just this limited policy of, of just you know, the evil union army actually fighting the battles and occupying better territory and then politicians like Lincoln actually you know we made Jake these you know, abolition um you know, a legal force. Yeah. So, like, all those three, just all the combined errors, we can't just focus on just one. Yeah. And I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well said. I think is a great example of historical change. It's a team effort. Different people are motivated by different things. Um, but they're all kind of pushing together towards this goal and pushing each other as well. So I think Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, no question there. You know, we don't want to take that away from him. Um, but we also have to understand the pressure that was put on Lincoln by Congress, by the Union Army, by the enslaved people who uh, exercised the power they had by escaping slavery, by seeing the Union Army as freedom, and by pushing everyone along to accept emancipation as, as, a, as a major, major war goal of the Union war effort. So thank you all very much for everything you brought to today's class. I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Lectures in History. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact, this companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>